We're going to start by just testing your memory um, of some major events and uh, please feel free to shout out the answers to, to help me out with this. So what, what is this event? Does anybody know? Yeah, and uh, anybody know the baby's name? Anybody follow the royals? Charlotte, Charlotte? yeah, Princess Charlotte. So in 2005, this year, not so long ago, we had the birth of Princess Charlotte. Um, what was this event? Anybody remember this event? Olympic Games. Yeah, the Olympic Games in London. And when was that? 2012. Yeah, 2012, so three years ago now. What about this one? Yeah, Royal Wedding. Kate and William. And what, what year was that? Anybody? 2009? Um, 2011 not as long ago as you thought four years ago and this one for football fans 1848 <laughs> <laughs> it's not the England team <laughs> it's one for Joel this it's uh, Spain winning the World Cup in 2010 this one this one goes back a little bit and Millennium? yeah the millennium in uh, Australia when we probably saw the first big fireworks associated with New Year's Eve and that was yeah 15 years ago now this one is <laughs> this is a bit of a royal theme here <laughs> anybody remember the date 70 83 81 so that's 34 years ago and there is one for England fans. 1966, yeah, you got it. So, 49 years ago. Of course, we don't all remember those events. Um, as some of us were, were not al alive in those years, but those who, who were alive, I'm sure they feel like it's only a short time ago uh, when those events happened. So doesn't time fly? And as we get older, time seems to get faster and faster, doesn't it? Weeks go by, months go by, and before we know it, another year goes by, or as we say, Christmas has come round again. So time seems to fly by so quickly, and before you know it, <laughs> you'll be dead. It's not a very comforting thought, is it? I know. Uh, quite a disturbing one, really, but one that is nonetheless true. And if, if time continues as it does, then there is but one certainty in our lives, and that is that we will all die. Some words that were written around 2,000 years ago sum up our lives. It says, your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. And we really don't know how long we will be alive for, do we? Some of the older ones here this evening have lived for a very long time, or so it would seem to the younger ones. And the younger ones perhaps think, well, I have a long time to go, don't I? But we know that there is no guarantee of that either. I was only 16 when a friend of mine was killed in a motorcycle accident. And it can happen at any time, can't it? So what does happen when we die? If our lives are relatively short, then what is there afterwards? And this is a fundamental question, isn't it? As the answer to this can have a big impact on how we live our lives today. And there are essentially two main beliefs as to what happens after we die. Some believe, some believe there's some better afterlife. Some talk about going to heaven. Some say there's an idyllic life on earth to come. And there is hope with this view, isn't there? Hope that what follows this life is a reward for what we do in this life. The other main belief is that there is no hope of anything beyond our death. That's it, this life is all there is, and once we're dead, then it's all over, it's gone forever. So this evening we're going to consider how we evaluate these two options and how we should respond to these two primary beliefs. How can we decide which one of these we should give um, more consideration to, serious consideration, and, and therefore which one should we spend our time investigating? Well, I'm going to keep this really simple. I'm going to use the metaphor of a card game to explore this choice that we have to make in our lives as to what each belief of what happens to us when we die offers to each one of us. 
And I don't want you to imagine that the fate of your life hangs on the choice of a card. So your fate is determined by which card you hold, when the game ends, when you die. There are only two cards to choose from, a black card or a white card. It's a really simple choice. But you can only hold one card at a time. And, and the game starts with you holding the black card. So you can choose to give up the black card for the white card or you can remain holding the black card to the end. The fate of your life depends on the card that you are holding when the game comes to an end. But which card wins is unknown. There is no end time to this game. Like we've already said, the length of our lives cannot be determined. So we can't think, oh well, I'll hold, I'll hold the black card until later in life and then I'll give some thought as to whether I want to change it to the white card. The game could end prematurely before you've even begun to consider whether you should change to the white card or not. So what does holding the black card offer? Well the black card says that there is nothing but this life. When you're holding the black card you are believing that there is nothing beyond death. That's it. It's all over when you die. Now the white card offers something completely different. It promises that everlasting life is on offer and it suggests that if you if, if you found holding the white card when the game ends then you win everlasting life and it also says that only you can only win everlasting life if you're holding the white card it says that the black card loses and those holding it will miss out on this everlasting life you might have heard people say well who wants to live forever anyway and, and perhaps they're thinking of living forever in a world that we see around us today with all its troubles, with its pains, its sufferings, its wars and, and its injustice and so on. But the white card is not offering everlasting life in the world we see around us. The white card offers life in a world where there will only be the best of everything. Life in an incredible world of peace and beauty. And there's just a few slides here, a sequence, just to remind you of how beautiful this world can be. <coughs> now, isn't that a world that you'd like to live in forever? And the white card gives us a picture of words, in words, of what the world, that world will be like. It says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. This is the picture that the white card gives us. A world where nature is at peace, people and animals living together in harmony, where there will be no harm done to anyone. So the claims of the two cards are, the black card says this is all there is, there is no hope after we die, and the white card says that there is everlasting life on offer to us if we're holding the white card when we die. But, as I've already mentioned, the, the, the problem is this, we don't know which of these cards is true, we don't know which card is the winner. So we have a dilemma to which card to choose. But you might be thinking, well, it's easy, I'll just pick the white card and, and hope that it's true and I get everlasting life. But there's a bit more to it than that. If I asked you, would you like to know more about one of the cards, I guess you might be quite intrigued to know more about the white card, as this is the one that appears to offer the most. So let's find out a little more about what is involved with holding the white card. First of all we have to say that the white card comes with a, an instruction manual and it's, it's quite a lengthy instruction manual. I have a copy of this manual here, it, it, it's, it's here, it's commonly known as the, the Holy Bible. Uh, and in this manual there are many examples of how people have lived lives that meet the requirements uh, of holding the white card so that the holder qualifies for everlasting life. There are also many examples of people who disqualified themselves from obtaining everlasting life. So it gives a very good idea as to what is required of a person if they choose to hold a white card. 
in the hope that they will receive everlasting life. Now within the manual are a set of rules essentially, or perhaps more accurately a set of guidelines. And there's one man's life recorded in the manual who lived an absolutely perfect life. So it gives anyone reading the manual a standard at which to aim for. And there's one passage in the manual that describes those it says will be disqualified from receiving everlasting life. It says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit everlasting life? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor adulterers, nor ad sorry, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit everlasting life. So then, what behaviour is encouraged then by the manual and encouraged of those who hold the white card? Well, let's open this manual, the instruction manual, if you'd like to join, join me, um, at Luke chapter 10. And here we have some words um, by that perfect man about what is required of a person who is holding the, the white card. <coughs> So Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal or everlasting life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbour as thyself. And he, and he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. So the perfect man Jesus then goes on to explain um, in this passage who our neighbours are. And, and he shows that our neighbours can literally be anyone. Anyone we know, anyone we come into contact with, anyone that needs our help and assistance. And how do we know that this love is being evidenced? Well, we have some words here. Um, it says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So those are the qualities that show up when something is being done from a position of love. And Jesus says we are to love God. But what does that mean? Well, in 1 John 5, we're told this is love for God to keep his commandments. So it's doing what God asks people to do, and he has detailed this in the instruction manual. So then how do the requirements of the instruction manual impact on the lives of those who choose to hold a white card? Well, that perfect man Jesus had these words to say. For whoever, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever sh will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. You see, it requires a giving of ourselves to others. It requires self-sacrifice. It requires us giving of our time and energies to God and to our neighbour. And even though even those who hold the white card find these words difficult to fully adopt all of the time, but they are the standard which the perfect man has set, which those holding the white card are to try and live up to. So what does the instruction manual have to say about what's on offer by living our life this way? What's the prize? What does it claim is the outcome if we end with the white card in our hands? It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, Jesus, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So there we have it, a brief summary of what the card requires to qualify for the prospect of everlasting life. But you might be thinking, well, that, you know, that's a lot to ask of me for a hope in something that I'm not certain will turn out to be true. You might be thinking, well, perhaps I'd like to take a, a look at that black card now and see what that has to offer. So let's do that. 
We'll start by identifying one major difference between the cards. The black card requires nothing from you to hold it. There is no instruction manual for this card. There are no particular rules to adhere to outside those required by law which both cards have to comply with. So when you're holding the black card you can do pretty much what you like in your life. You can choose to do everything for yourself. You can do things which other people won't like. You're free to ignore the request from others to help them. You can go about your life with only your own interests at heart. You can look after number one as they say. So what kind of behaviour does this lead to? It leads to behaviour that is often offensive to others. It can lead to doing things without regard for others. It can get us into situations where we are of a little help to others. It becomes all about us rather than about others. And the instruction manual that comes with the white card has something to say about this because it recognises what mentality the black card creates in people. It says, if there is no everlasting life on offer, then let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If there is no hope of everlasting life, nothing after this life, and no rules to live our lives by, then we might as well do whatever we want. There's nothing to restrain us. And there was a man who lived about 3,000 years ago who was renowned for his wisdom. He wrote many proverbs that we still have today and he became very rich. His name was Solomon and he was king in Israel. And his wealth allowed him to try everything that was available to men and women in, this, in his day. He would have been the equivalent of a billionaire today. And we're now going to read some of the words um, that he wrote after he experienced a life full of pleasure. So we're now going to read that passage together um, of Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 1 to 17. So then Ecclesiastes chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. Behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainted mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water, to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle, above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold, and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, and the delight of the sons of men, as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great, and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept it not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labour, and this was my portion of all my labour. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labour that I had laboured to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. And I turned myself to, to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath been already done? Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happened to them all. Then said I in my heart, As it happened to the fool, so it happened even to me. And why was I then more wise? 
And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as the fool. Therefore I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. So the summary of those words we just read together looked like this. I undertook great projects, I built houses for myself, I made gardens and parks, I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delight of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. So chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. So this man Solomon allowed himself to enjoy all the pleasures available to him. But what was the conclusion that he came to? Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Why do people gain from all their, their labours, what do people gain from all their labours at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, no one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. If, as they say, we can't take anything with us when we die, then all of that hard work does nothing for us when we're dead. This wise man came to some quite sobering conclusions, didn't he? And about a thousand years later, another wise man wrote some similar words. He said, For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? If a person becomes in control of the whole world but then dies, then it's of no benefit to them ultimately. So this brings us to the time of death. What do the cards say will happen to us the moment we die? What happens as soon as our breath gives out and our heart stops? And this is where the two cards actually agree. And let's turn to another passage in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 9. And see some more words of that wise man Solomon. And this is what the white card says about when we die. So Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 2. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean, and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner. And he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. This is an evil, evil among all things that are done under the sun. That there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live. After that they go to the dead. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished, neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So the white card is saying that when we die, it's over, we cease to exist. And in another part of the instruction manual it says that even our thoughts perish. We're dead and our bodies start to decay to finally return into the earth. We have no awareness, we are gone. And as we've already seen, the white card does offer something beyond this life, uh, and we'll come to that in a few moments. So then let's consider this from the point of view of the black card and what happens when we die. If we're holding the black card when we die, what happens? What does the black card claim that we have? What happens? Well, once you're dead, if the black card is right, what do you know? Do you know whether you had a whether you were good or bad person? Do you know whether you were a billionaire or penniless? Do you know whether you were famous or infamous? 
Do you know whether you were, had, had a life full of pain or whether there was peace in your life? Do you know whether there was suffering or whether you had a lot of joy? Or do, does, do you know whether you were lonely or fulfilled? The second you die, your thoughts have gone. You cease to exist, you know nothing of your life. There is no memory, there is no re recall. So what happened during your life, whether you were good or bad, whether you were rich or poor and so on, is gone. It's completely gone. And this is what the black card says will happen to you. So when you die, if the black card is right, it's like you never existed. It's like you never lived before. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 says, The living at least know they will die, but the dead know not anything. They have no further reward. It's just like the wise man Solomon said, it's like you never lived. Will anyone remember your life in a hundred years time? Possibly. What about a thousand years time? Or a hundred thousand years time? Extremely unlikely. And even if they did remember you, what difference does it make to you when you are dead and how, have no knowledge of this? So let's consider the same aspect with the white card. What happens when we die if we hold the white card? What do you know? Do you know if you've been good or bad? Do you know whether you've been rich or poor? Do you know if you've been famous or not? All the same questions. What do you know when you, that moment you're gone, well, that moment you've died, if you're holding the white card and what the white card says? Well, you don't know. It's just the same as the black card. When we die, then all our memories are gone. We cease to exist. We don't know what our life was like. In fact, we don't know anything as we are no longer have any existence. But as we've said, the white card does come with a promise, a hope of something after death. It offers everlasting life in an amazing world. But how can this be if we cease to exist when we die? Well, the white card is, is a promise of future awakening by being brought out of the sleep of death, being resurrected back to life. And the instruction manual tells about this. It says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So here it's referring to the death to death as a sleep. The dust of the earth are the bodies that have decayed and returned into the ground. So it's speaking of those that have died and being returned to life. But some will receive everlasting life, but some will not, and will only receive shame and contempt. So this is the claim of the white card. So we now know enough about these two cards, I think, to think about the implications of what happens when each card wins and the other card loses. The implication of one card being true and the other being false, which is what will happen at the end of the game. Only one can be the winner. There will be a winner. We don't know that now, but there will be a winner. So let's look at the implications of what happens if we're holding each of the cards. So let's first consider what the implications are. If the black card is the winner and there is nothing after, after death. So if the black card is the winner, then does it matter how we've lived? Does it matter what our life has amounted to, what we've achieved? Does it matter what we've done for others? Does it matter what we've done for ourselves? It doesn't matter at all. Nothing matters in our life as everything will soon become like it never happened anyway. We may think it matters now whilst we're still alive, whilst we're here today. We may think it matters what we say to people. It matters what we think about people. It matters what we do to others. But if the black card is the winner, then nothing matters. It can't. What you do now in your life won't matter a bit in a million years time if the black card is the winner. So does it matter? Absolutely not. So we can summarise the position of the black card if it is the winner. If the black card wins, then there is nothing after death. Then we have no memory of our life. Then why do we bother? 
As the wise man Solomon said, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless, there's, no, there's just no purpose to anything. It's all meaningless. That was the conclusion of his very expensive and elaborate life that he spent experiencing all these pleasures. So that's, let's now consider the other side of the coin, as it were. What happens if the white card is the winner? If there is an offer of everlasting life after death? Does it matter what we do? Does it matter how we live today? Does it matter what our, our life amounts to? What we've done? Does it matter what we have done for others? Does it matter what we have done for ourselves? It absolutely matters what we do. It matters because it will determine whether we live forever in a wonderful world or we're condemned to shame and contempt. So let's now consider what happens to those holding the opposite card to the one that wins, the losers as it were. So if, so if the black card is the winner but you've chosen to hold the white card and go with everything that it entails, we're trying to do the right thing, live the right way, follow the instruction manual and trying to follow that perfect example of Jesus, what happens to you as the loser? Or remember what happens when we die with a black card. Both cards end with a person losing all memory of their life at death. There's no reward after death if the black card is the winner. So even though you will have been holding the white card and have lost, you have lost out on what? Absolutely nothing. And what's even more ironic is that when the black card is the winner, you won't even know you've been wrong because you'll be dead you won't have any ex existence no memory you have no knowledge of things how things have turned out you won't even know that you have lost now let's consider what happens if it's the other way around and you have chosen to hold on to that black card you were given at the start and not swap it for the white card and all that comes with it what happens if the white card and its instruction manual turn out to be true what will happen to you if you don't have that white card in your hand and are still holding on to the black card? We're told in the instruction manual, there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets given everlasting life but you yourselves thrown out. So the two cards can pretty much be summed up like this. The black card, there's nothing to gain there's everything to lose. The white card, there's everything to gain and nothing to lose. And there are some words that I came across which pretty much sum this all up in one sentence. It says, if you think there's no God and you're living like he does not exist, then you had better be right. If we think there's no God and we ignore him and his instruction manual, then we're putting ourselves at risk of being with those that will be weeping and distraught if it turns out that God exists and he does what he says he's promised in his word, the Bible. So this then leads us naturally on to ask the question, how do we find out if the claims of the white card are true? We need to start by looking into the instruction manual as the clues are contained within its pages. We need to try and find out whether the manual is trustworthy. And we do that by asking some fundamental questions. Questions like, is there any evidence that would suggest that the universe has a designer as the author of the Bible claims to, to be? Or did it all just happen by chance and without meaning and purpose? Is the book considered historically accurate? Is there evidence for the people and the places spoken of and the events that are recorded in it? And does it make any claims that it can predict the future? And if so, have any of these claims shown themselves to be right and the events have happened? And does the book tie together? It's, it's a huge volume, so is it consistent throughout its pages? Does it have threads running through it that show it's more than just a collection of man's writings over hundreds of years? Or does it have the hallmark of some greater mind than man's? And we can't answer these questions this evening, but all of these questions are answered regularly in this room by covering the diverse subjects that, that make up the evidence that the instruction manual that comes with the white card is to be taken seriously. 
and to hold the white card it's not just a case of picking it up we must do something to take hold of it we must there, must, there are actions to follow we must believe that God exists and that he rewards those that seek him and then we must be baptised and this baptism is a symbol of the death and the resurrection of Jesus it's a symbol that shows that there can be life after death so let's summarise what we've been through this evening uh, we started by reminding ourselves that life is short however old or young we are life can be cut short we don't know when the end will come and I put to you that we have a choice to make we can choose between two ways between two cards a black one or a white one the black card says that there's nothing after death and we can live how we want there are no restraints, there are no requirements on us we can do as we please but if we want to consider what's on offer from the white card then we need to check out the promise made in the Bible and determine whether what it says could be true and then if we decide it's true we can then take hold of the, the white card and try and follow the example of the Lord Jesus and so the choice is yours you can either stay holding on to that black card that says that all there is is this life or you can drop the black card and take the white card and have a hope of everlasting life in an incredible world whichever way it turns out holding on to the black card only leads to death but taking hold of the white card holds out the promise of hope of life forever and so I leave it with you which card will you choose please don't leave the decision until it's too late thank you